What's up, everybody? We're going to start early, because YOLO, why not? I haven't sent the packet squirrel yet. Don't ask about the packet squirrel. I made his hand deliver it. Don't hate, I have been out of town and incredibly busy. Hey FSU. Hey Rory, how's it going? Hey Jeff. Hey Super Crunchy. Hey JBL. Hey Neon. New York was great, man. I didn't want to come home. I never spent more than 24 hours in New York, so uh, actually being able to be there and, and really get some time in, that was nice. Be able to walk around and get outside of the, the city in Times Square and stuff like that it was really nice to actually see what the city had to offer. Hey Jake, how's it going? Hey Rumham. Got about another minute, then we'll kick it off here. Yo, MTX, how you doing? We did go to a Broadway show, actually. Uh, no mob bosses, no, unfortunately. If, uh, if I did see any, they didn't tell me they were they were a mob boss. I'm doing all right, MTX. We went and saw The Lion King, which was really good. Just the, the stage production, don't, don't even, like, you know the singers are going to be able to sing and everything's going to be good, but just, like, they have a small stage, and the stage production and, like, the, the wardrobe, the animals, everything that they did, super impressive. The actors are super impressive. Um, just how they do their set is really cool. Hey, Leah, how's it going? We did go to Long Island. Was he killed this week in Long Island? Hey, Scott, how's it going? You know, I'm waiting. I just saw the, the Lion King trailer drop today, so I'm excited. Oh, you're talking about the uh, the mob hit that happened? Yeah. They were saying that's like the highest ranking one since the 80s in terms of a hit of that caliber. So that's interesting. Hey, sick in the mind. Uh, we stayed on 11th and 41st, 42nd. So it was kind of near the water. Like we were right by the, the pier. We weren't like by Chelsea or anything, but we were close to that area. We were maybe 10 minutes walk from Times Square. You're not feeling the Disney live movies? I don't know. Uh, I saw Aladdin. Aladdin was pretty good. Or not Aladdin. What was it? Uh, the, the Jungle Book. Sorry, The Jungle Book was good. Aladdin's coming out. Hey, thanks for the uh, the sub, Saucy. I appreciate it. AKA X Cracked. The dog barking got your dog curious. So my wife is actually out tonight. She decided that she's going to go out with coworkers uh, since I don't pay her any attention on Wednesday nights anyway. And she's usually the dog herder. So I have nobody to herd the dogs. <laughs> And the dog, we have one dog that barks at any little noise at all, or no noises. She's schizophrenic. It's, I've Googled it. There's no such thing as schizophrenia in dogs. I would argue that she is schizophrenic uh, until you can prove me wrong. But she is uh, barking at everything whenever she can. Uh, per Twitch rules, cannot stream Twitch and YouTube simultaneously. Now that I am a uh, affiliate, affiliate level, you can't do both. What's up, J Delta? All right, my people, we are going to be doing uh, OSINT tonight. So I'm going to get the PowerPoint presentation up. 
and then we will get started. Do you get a Twitch subscriber rank if it's Twitch Prime on the Discord? Yeah, you'll get a Twitch Twitch rank as long as your Twitch is tied to your Discord. You'll get status in the Discord channel. Oh yeah, and you get Mary Berry, you get Pikachu, and you get Heat Sir for your uh, emojis now. If you're a subscriber, I went and finally did the emojis. Oh yeah, you get Mary Berry. All right, guys, getting a little distracted. Let's do screen only here. We could save the chit chat for afterwards. So welcome to week four. We are covering the five phases of hacking, maybe 10 minutes, probably five minutes. It won't take that long. Uh, then we're going to talk about Passive Recon or OSINT, and then we'll do the Q&A AMA like we always do. Okay, note, please only use the information learned in this course for ethical purposes. From here on out, we are getting into the hacking phase of the course. So please, please stay ethical. Don't join the dark side. This is dark enough. With that being said, let's go ahead and cover the five stages of hacking. So stage one is reconnaissance. Now reconnaissance is basically information gathering. So we have passive and we have active. I would actually consider active to be more of a level two or a scanning phase. Passive is when we do information gathering that doesn't involve the client or the entity itself. Right. So we're going to be looking up maybe LinkedIn information or Google information, Twitter, Facebook, whatever we can to gather information. But we're not going to be um, attempting any scans on that server or scans against the host, um, et cetera. That's more of active reconnaissance. And I consider that to actually be scanning. Um, so once we gather the information that we need, and we're going to be talking about phase one right now, and as we go through the course, we're going to hit hard on phases two and three. We will touch on four and five as well, uh, but as a pen tester, you don't need four and five as much. Uh, I'm not saying that they're not important, but we'll talk about um, how you would maintain access if you need to and how to clean up when you're done with a pen test. Now, if you're doing red teaming, uh, it becomes a little different and four and five become more important um, if you're acting like you're an APT or something like that. So once we do phase one, we're going to go ahead and go into phase two, which is scanning and enumeration. This is your MMAP, your Nessus, your Nikto, um, your Metasploit can do scanning, OpenVAS is a scanner. So we'll cover some of the different scanning tools, how to read those, what ports to cover, you know, et cetera, as we get into that. I won't dive too much into that right now. Um, and then gaining access. So once we do our scanning enumeration, steps one and steps two, really steps two, I would consider probably the most important. But the more information and the more, uh, you know, the more enumeration you do, the better off you are. So hacking is all enumeration. Uh, enumeration, enumeration, enumeration. Even after you gain access, there's a whole nother level of enumeration, especially if you're just a low privilege user, or even if you have a domain admin account. Uh, doesn't mean you have the goods, right? Just because you're domain admin, there still might be some information out there that you want or need, and you need to figure out where that's at and find it. Uh, so we're going to play a big part here, or do a big part in terms of learning how to scan properly and learning how to enumerate. Uh, but that will be later on in the course. But these are the most important lessons. Um, I can show you how to exploit all day, but if you don't know how to find these things, uh, you, you're not going to be a good, good pen tester, good hacker, etc. cetera. Uh, so once we do our scanning enumeration, we find a way in. This is called gaining access. Uh, so we gain access either through some sort of exploit, social engineering, uh, et cetera. Once we have access, we want to maintain access, right? So 
we are uh, looking for a way to uh, maintain access in the network, not get detected, um, depending on how we want to do it. What if we have a session and, uh, you know, something happens where they reboot the machine and we lose the session, right? What, how can we prevent that? How can we be on um, multiple, you know, multiple interfaces and not get disconnected or detected? Uh, so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about covering tracks as well. Um, there's a lot of tools that we'll do that will auto cover our tracks. Uh, so that's really uh, useful. Like, for example, you'll see me use PS exec. PS exec uses SMB credentials to get a shell. Uh, so when we're in there, what will happen is you'll, you'll connect to the SMB server. It'll upload a reverse shell. It'll connect to the reverse shell, and then it'll delete it for you. Um, so some programs do cover your tracks for you, but you don't want to leave malware behind or any information that you have uh, been there behind. That includes if you're uh, if you're pen testing, really not important on that aspect, like deleting logs. But if you're a red teamer or uh, an APT, you're definitely going to be trying to uh, trying to cover your tracks. So uh, thank you for the donation, Bammers. I appreciate that, Brent. Uh, $101, that's a lot. Thank you so much. Um, and Rory says, PS exec is very loud. Don't be fooled. This is true. Uh, depends on who you're going up against. Most sims won't detect it. Uh, I should say mo most environments, I shouldn't say most sims, most environments don't detect it because they don't either have their, uh, their sim tuned correctly or they're not running a sim at all. So that's really it. It's, it's more of a cyclical cycle, right? Um, you sometimes when you view this chart, you see it in a one to five in a circle. Um, but you, you go through these steps uh, when you're doing an engagement or doing any sort of hacking. Uh, so it's important that we go in order and then talk about these things. So today we're going to be talking about passive recon. And I'm breaking it down into uh, a couple different types here. Uh, and I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint the whole time. Uh, basically... What I want to talk about is let's talk about physical and social first. So if I'm doing recon for physical or social, um, some things I might want to look at. So maybe satellite images, right? Or I have a coworker who does great physical work, and he actually has a drone that he flies out and around the building to look at the building layout. And that's another thing, right? Building layout. So with these, you want to know where the badge readers are, where the break areas are, what the security looks like, what type of fencing there is. Do, are people leaving doors open? Um, you know, what kind of information can you get about the location? Uh, so you want to know what areas you might want to hit hard um, and where to attack the weak points. So, you know, you're probably not going through the front door. Sometimes you have to go through the front door when you're doing a physical. Um, but a lot of times you don't have to do that at all. Uh, there's a lot of sneakier ways, cloning badges, uh, a lot of things you can do. Social engineering, you know, go by the smoke area and chat somebody up and then just have them hold the door for you. You know, tailgating, everything. You want to know your building layout and location information as best as possible. Um, also going into a social aspect, in these both, these, this starts to become important for not just physical, but when you're starting to do host assessments and uh, web assessments as well. So... Uh, we're interested in job information, right? Like who the employees are, what's their name, what's their job title, what's their phone number, who's their manager. You want to try to build out um, some sort of, you know, I guess uh, topology for employees. You got to figure out who you're going to target. Um, like today, I was doing a, uh, a debrief on a client that we had and they had on the public web their help desk portal, but their help desk portal listed every single name of the their help desk employees, and there's about 10 of them. Um, that's just, you know, it's not an exploit, but that's really good information for me. If I want to call another employee and say, hey, I'm Joe from help desk, um, you know, and Robert's my manager or whoever, and you try to, uh, to impersonate somebody. So as much information as you can gather and what field they're in, what they do. You want to try to map out as much as possible. You should know who the VPs are, who the CEO is, um, et cetera. You don't want to you know, say the wrong name to the wrong person and ruin everything, especially if you're on a physical engagement or a social engineering engagement. Um, that also includes pictures. 
Uh, so one thing that we look for when we're doing physical engagements is we'll find who the employees are and then we'll look them up on Twitter. We'll look them up on Facebook. We'll look them up on LinkedIn. And you will not believe how many times they have their badge in a picture, their desk in a picture, computer photos. I mean, there's so much information that we can find. If you've got a badge photo, okay, we know how to clone uh, an image of your badge, right? If you've got a desk photo, what are we looking at? Well, we can be able to see what the letterhead is. Um, perhaps if you've got some letterhead on your desk or like a company calendar, we're just trying to look for logos, design, anything that we can use to make a fake badge if we need to. Um, you know, and computer photos. I've come across plenty of computer photos that show what kind of software you're running. Uh, you're going to tell me what maybe what kind of Outlook if you're using, um, you know, like I've seen some Slack channels information, um, a lot of things that people don't don't think about, right? Like um, I've seen accounting information on a photo posted on Twitter before because somebody took a photo of their desk. Um, people are the weakest link. They'll always be the weakest link. You could have the strongest barriers possible and it won't matter, right? I mean, so a lot of this is employee training and et cetera, but this is the kind of information that we are after. And a lot of people are talking about badge cloning. So we use a tool. It was about two grand. It's called, uh, it's called Boss Cloner. Basically, you can build it yourself for about 500 bucks. It gives you all the instructions. But if you want it built for you, it's two grand. Um, it doesn't work with every type of RFID. But if you get close enough, you can pretty much capture an RFID and then um, use that to gain entry. So it's very, very easy. We're not going to go into to the physical side of things and how to, you know, hack doors and all that stuff. Um, I have a really good coworker who I would love to bring in for that. And maybe I will get him to bring in. He is uh, by far uh, the best physical pen tester I've come across. Um, so if we do a physical lesson later on down the road, I think I would, I would definitely bring him in. Um, so when we come across, so let's say the passive recon for the web and the host, well, we need to do a couple things as well. Uh, so we got to do target validation, right? We can do that with Whois, NSLOOKUP, DNS Recon. There's a ton of tools. Uh, basically, we need to verify that the IP space or the host or whatever that they give us is indeed their ownership. A lot of times you're going to get a subnet or uh, you know just an IP range. And they'll include the router for the ISP in there or something like that that's not theirs, doesn't belong to them, and you shouldn't be scanning or pen testing against it. Uh, so it's important that you look up the website that they give you and make sure that they own it, um, that they didn't make a typo or any sort of information like that. So, um, But also for recon terms, um, who is is useful. Sometimes they don't put, uh, they don't put a protected, I guess, owner in there. They'll put their own owner. Sometimes it's not private. Uh, so you might be able to get um, owner information with a address, etc. Mostly everybody goes the private route, uh, but some people don't. Uh, NS lookup, DNS recon, uh, we use these tools for a lot of things. Uh, finding subdomains is important as well. Uh, so you could just do some Google Foo. We could use Dig, Nmap, Sublister, Bluto, CRT.sh, etc. Um, there's a ton of tools for that that we can do, but finding subdomains helps us out as well uh, just to find a little bit more information about the site. Maybe we'll find something like a dev.google.com or something along those lines. Um, you know, like whatever site we're looking for, maybe they have a dev environment they didn't want us to know about. Um, and we'll find that information online. Uh, same thing with fingerprinting. In fingerprinting, I'm I'm kind of iffy on because I kind of call it active recon because you're going to the website itself uh, with a lot of this. So Nmap, it's definitely active recon because we're going to scan against it. Wapalizer is a tool that we use to see what they're running. Basically, with fingerprinting, we're trying to see um, what type of tools or backend that that website or host is using. Typically, this is for a website, um, but we want to know, you know, what type of of software might be running. So, what web is good for that? Built with is good for that. Even using Netcat to get the headers of the site might tell you some information. 
Uh, so being able to fingerprint a host, uh, it falls under passive slash active, I would call it. You can do uh, a little bit of both. So it depends on what you do to make it passive or active here. And then lastly, data breaches. So have I been pwned or similar list? Uh, so tools that we have covered here, um, like Bluto itself or the Harvester, uh, some of these will check through. I don't know if the Harvester does, actually. Some of these will check through lists to see um, if there have been credentials found for that domain in Have I Been Pwned. Uh, but we're going to talk about this a little bit heavy here and then in a later lesson when we get into hacking. Um, so tonight, I'm going to show you a script that I wrote in Bash. And what we'll do is basically what it does is run through a clear text password list to try to find passwords through, uh, you know, through for a domain that we supply. So we'll see how that works and how we can use it and think about how we can use it. Um, so plenty more tools than what I noted here, and we'll cover some of these. We'll cover not all of these, and we'll uh, we'll just go as we go. So lastly, before we get started, like I just said, there are a lot of OSINT tools. Please don't hate me if we don't cover them all. I know you guys know a ton about OSINT tools, I'm sure, um, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them. I don't even know half of them, probably. There's so many cool little things out there that um, are, I'm sure are helpful. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I know, how I would do it on an assessment, and what we're actually going to do tonight is we are going to go through... Um, we're going to go through... Uh, a, a client of our choice. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Bug Crowd. We're going to pick out some clients that might interest us. What I want to do is I want to pick something that may be um, medium to smaller size. I don't want like a large client because that's just going to take too long to dig through. I want something that we can gather a lot of information on in a short period of time. Um, so we'll throw out some, some names or companies and then we'll uh, try to do OSINT on them. Uh, no, you can't pick me, but you're welcome to OSINT me. You guys have already been doing that today, so you're, uh, you're welcome to continue doing that. But the goal here today, too, is we're going to do this collectively as a group. I'm going to show you some of the things that we can look for and that we can do. But at the same time, I want you guys to be looking on your own and then posting some information in the chat. Uh, that way, we, we have that information, and we can kind of collectively do this as a group. Um, so what we're going to do is if you go to bugcrowd.com and you do the programs, if you do programs up here, uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to pick one out of here that we want to do. Um, so I would pick something on the smaller side if we had that choice. So, but we can pick, um, something on the medium to medium to smaller size if we can. So if you see anything in here that is of interest, we can do it. Or what we can do is I was messing around with Tesla before per uh, Davey's recommendation. Actually, we can do Tesla. Um, but any of these would be, be pretty good clients here. Tesla sounds good. Uh, we can do Tesla if you guys want. Pinterest, we're not getting a. I, I need I need two votes for one thing, and then we'll we'll call it. How about that? But we're taking the DoD out of this. Davy's being cheeky. Tesla, you guys want to do Tesla? Okay, we'll do Tesla. All right, so you guys are going to do your own OSINT while I do OSINT as well, but I'm going to show you, follow along, see if you come up with anything interesting that I don't come up with. Um, so a few things. One I've already got up here. If we look. So if you want to go create an account, go to hunter.io. Basically, this will tell us, uh, we just enter a domain name and it'll search through email addresses and try to find people with that email address. Um, I think you get like 20 free searches a month or something like that if we go into pricing. 
You get 20 free a month. That's plenty for what we're doing tonight. Uh, you can also use an API key with the harvester on this and some other tools. I think Bluto has it now too, where you can use hunter.io um, and use one of these API keys. So we'll go back and what we're looking for is just information here. So let's search tesla.com. And what we're doing is we're looking at what type of pattern do they have, right? So we got the most common pattern first, last at tesla.com. And if we scroll through, it looks like we got 344 results. We can export this to a CSV, which is useful. Um, and yeah, if we're searching through it here, we definitely see we get some job titles sometimes, right? Um, we get, okay, it says CEO here, but we get email addresses of potentially interesting people. And what this allows us to do too is enumeration. Um, if we know for a situation here, it's not always true, but say we have a login interface. And a lot of times, um, something like Outlook, right? Say we know just the common pattern. We don't have 344 names, but we go to Outlook and we try to... Um, we try to enumerate usernames through that because Outlook Web Access has a feature where it's a timing delay. If the username is valid, it will come back pretty quick. If the username is not valid, then it won't come back right away. And there's that timing delay that allows us to be able to enumerate users. Um, we could take common first initials, common last names, put those into a list and um, heave some of that at this search if we wanted to as an example. Now, if they have limiting going on, which a lot of places don't, um, that will prevent us, you know, and if it depends how patient we are. If we're doing this on an assessment, probably not. If we're hacking and trying to be patient, maybe. Um, these are just things to, to look for, look through. Um, and with the time tonight, I see a lot of you guys are making suggestions in the chat. Um, definitely awesome. You guys can, can do that. I'm not going to touch on those as much only because we got a lot to go through in a little bit of time. Um, but definitely submit information as you see it and hopefully we can find some good stuff. Um, so for me, what I would start doing is gathering these names. Um, but somebody did mention that, um, looking through cred dumps and I would, I was thinking about when I wanted to do that, when I wanted to show that off, but that is really the first thing that I do. Um, so basically, if you think about all the breaches and like the Have I Been Pwn collection, right? Um, there is something out there and the list may be updated. And if you guys got an updated list, please send it my way because I would love to uh, improve what I've got. But there's a 1.4 billion clear text password list. Uh, let's just see if we can Google it. If you guys are interested, I have the link. I just want to see if we can Google it. Uh, 1.4 billion clear text. I think it's a GitHub. Yeah, this TensorFlow right here, this GitHub. There is a magnet link in here. It's got plenty of people, probably the NSA watching it, uh, but a lot of people sharing it. You just copy this magnet, paste it, have your torrent and uh, download it. It's 44 gigs, right? Uh, but what it does is it has 1.4 billion clear text passwords. So um, not hashes, clear text passwords. So if you build a tool to parse through these passwords, uh, you may be able to find some useful information. So let's look at something here. I'm going to go to my files and show you kind of what this looks like. If we go to other locations, and I like to put things into my opt folder. So if we go to opt, and we go to, so I built this tool, it's called Breach Parse, very basic bash script. It's all hard coded, nothing special. So you, when you download this, you get this breach compilation, right? This folder here, and it gives you this data folder here. And it has all these subfolders that you have you click into here, you click on one of these documents, open it up, and you've got usernames and passwords all throughout. Um, so what you, what you don't want to do is use this for bad, right? This, there's definitely a lot of credentials in here. 
Um, I'm sure if you went to and pulled out something like all the yahoo.com, you may be able to put that into burp suite, put that through intruder and get access to yahoo.com. Something like that, right? Don't do that. Bad, bad. We're going to use this for good. Um, so let's take a look at the script I wrote. Don't judge my script writing, please. Okay, this is a very basic script here, and I just, can we, there we go. All right. So everything, uh, everything that we've been doing leading up to this has built up to this, right? We did three weeks basically of scripting and programming and uh, everything else in here. So this is a bin bash up the top, declared. You see it has an if statement. All I'm looking for is if there's two arguments. If there are not two arguments, then we're going to echo out the uh, information, how to use it, and uh, more usage down here. So basically, the usage here is breach, par breach parse, the domain we want to search, and the file to output. If you want to create it in Python, more than welcome. I will paste this script into the Discord server, and you guys are more than welcome to use it, modify it, improve it, please. Uh, improvements are great. So, um, so basically, we come into here, and you see if we want to do a multiple domain, we can search like at Gmail, pipe, at Yahoo, and then just put it multiple.txt. Um, and then we do an else here, which you probably could have put into a function, but I'm a terrible programmer. Uh, basically, we are creating some variables. I create a variable full file here and set it to the second argument, which is this. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do is parse out if they put something other than .txt. We're going to make it .txt ourselves. Uh, so we take a base name of the file, we cut out the period, and then I put it into three files. So there is a master file. There's a user's file, and there's a password file. If you looked at when we were in that uh, text document, it was uh, username colon password. So just to make it friendly, I've split it out into three files, but also kept the username colon password in a master. Um, then what we do is we touch a master file here, and we set a total file count here by counting it, and we have a file count currently of zero, the only reason we do that is because I put in a progress bar. That way it can count how many files we have counted and then what total file number we have to count a percentage out and know where the heck we are at. Because uh, when I first built this, it was running for 10 minutes and I had no idea how close it was to finishing. Um, so this is a function bar that I stole somewhere and just updated for my own personal needs. And then what we do is we basically find uh, every single file that's in every single folder and we read through those, right? Uh, so what we do is a little loop here. We grep through those, and we write whatever we find that dollar sign one. This is our first argument. So if I say at tesla.com, it's going to search at tesla.com in the file, and then it's going to print it out to this master file. OK, then it's going to increase the file count by one. This is for our progress bar, and then we're done. We end our if statement here. And then we take a little nap for three seconds. Um, and then we do awk. All we're doing is this is print dollar sign one. We're grabbing the, um, the users here. And then we're grabbing the passwords. And then we exit out. And we are done. So we're going to go ahead and let this run. Take a look at what this looks like. And I've created an alias for it. So it's just breach parse. And then we're going to say Tesla dot, actually, at Tesla.com. And then we'll just save this to Tesla.txt, but it's going to strip the .txt off anyway and make it its own thing. We'll let that run. And what you'll see is we're not going to get back um, I've already done this search. I'm not going to get back a ton of results, but we will get some results. Most of them are kind of, they look iffy. Um, it's more promising on on other assessments. Tesla's pretty locked down. 
Uh, but w- when you look at a client like the debrief I had today, they had 900 and something users on this list. Um, this is one of the easiest ways to to get in when we're doing OSINT, right? So uh, we talk about Outlook and we talk about the issues that we have. Uh, so say we take this list and all we do is we pass it into Outlook and we send it with the username and the password that we found. We could not at all have the correct usernames and passwords, right? Um, but what we can find, perhaps, okay, say we do have the username and password, easy in, we just got access to the email at least. Uh, if we don't have the correct username and password, if Outlook is doing some sort of username enumeration, then what do we have? Well, we know what usernames are good, what usernames are bad. We can remove the bad usernames, keep the good usernames, and then we start throwing passwords at it, which is called password spraying. Um, that's like winter 2018 exclamation point or spring 2019 exclamation point. Uh, password one or the company name like Tesla one, two, three. So basically you're looking for some sort of password that might get you in, right? Um, so if they're not doing any rate limiting, that's an issue. Another thing that we can look at when we're in these documents Uh, I like to look through it and I like to see, because this isn't just grabbing a single user, it may grab the user five times if the user's been breached five times. And what we see sometimes in there is we see patterns. Their password may have been JSON123, then it may be JSON234, JSON345. Okay, I know their pattern is probably their name or the name JSON with three numbers on the end of it and in some sort of incremental order. That has gotten me in before as well. So these are the the things that you need to think about when we're doing OSINT in terms of password gathering off breach list. We're going to talk about this way more heavily. I'm just giving you the concepts and what things to think about. Um, But these are the things that we'll cover later on in the course when we get into that situation where um, we've tried everything else. There's no visual exploits. Everything looks patched, but we can still get our way in, Um, especially if social engineering is off Um, out of scope. A lot of times you'll have an external, but social engineering will be out of scope. So if it's out of scope, then you're limited to what you can do and what you see. Um, And sometimes you don't get a lot on an external scan. So let's go ahead and just take a look at what we've found. So if we LS here, you'll see that we've got uh, we got the Tesla users, Tesla master, and Tesla passwords. Let's just go ahead and look at the master We'll just cat that out. That's what's happening for your current engagement. They want red team, but not allowed to social engineer. Yeah, then it's not really red team, is it? Red team and pen testing are two different beasts. Okay, so we don't have a lot here. We, we really don't. Um, and what did we see before? We saw we saw a user, or first initial, last name, right? And when I'm looking through these, I'm not seeing any first initial, last name. Uh, you, you have first names a bunch of times. Kirk, Letitia, Isabella, this Tesla 9. Uh, the shark here. So this could be maybe an S Hark. Uh, it looks like maybe at some point, if these are true, it looks like at some point they had a first name option or they had a first name dot last name option. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of first initial last names. So we're getting some sort of mixed results when we look at the hunter.io and we compare it to this, right? Um, so who knows? But our next step here would be to take these credentials and try to push them to through a login if we could. Um, and you want to look for patterns, right? Like you see the shark at Tesla. Look at the 907-DADE-814. You see capitalize some things in there. Um, it would not be very difficult to set a rule set and alternate some of these letters with 814, 907, and then alternating DADE somehow with uh, capitalization. They're probably honeypot creds placed by Tesla. That would be some next level stuff. 
could be matured email addresses started with first last had to grow also possible decoy creds are possible so these are these are the things we look for though this is this is my first go to when it comes to OSINT. So you guys were mentioning it. I figured I'll show you first. I was going to show you more towards the end, but okay. So we've gathered some information on what usernames might look like. Um, if we were to start attacking, we would use these credentials against them on login forms. Um, but we're not attacking. We are just getting uh, information, right? We're doing reconnaissance. So. What else can we do? Well, I like to just go out to the website. That's one of my fun things to do. Let's just go to tesla.com. Maybe buy a Tesla while we're here. Or a roof. Solar panels, man. All right, I like to look at contact information, location information. So let's look at contact. Okay, so you get some more email addresses here, press, EU press, whatever. Um, they've got store locations when you're trying to find your nearest Tesla store. My next giveaway is a Tesla 3. I'll need a lot more donations for that. Okay, look at this, though. This is cool. We have all of their offices... And not only do we have all their offices, they have given us map views already, aerial views of them. That's pretty cool. So let's just click on Tesla headquarters. And now I haven't gone this far in into the satellite or anything, so we're we're diving in a new new territory here. So we want to zoom in as much as we can and try to find information that we can. Um, you want to know what their parking lot looks like. Not only do you want to know what their parking lot looks like, you want to know if there is, say, like an adjacent parking lot or like a sandwich shop or something nearby that you can park. And that's what we do when we um, say like we fly the drone around, right? When my coworker flies his drone around, we'll go park way over here. That thing has like a three or four mile range. And what we'll do is we'll fly it over here. We'll take a peek at what's going on and see what we can do. Um, so we're looking for, for doors, areas of interest, parking. Uh, is there a security guard gate area that's on site? Not really seeing that. Yep, so we can just dig in as, as deep as we can go, um, but eventually we'll get to a street view, and maybe sometimes street view helps too. Um, but we just want to gather as much information that we can about, about them. Let's see if we can double-click on the street and get in here. Uh, I'm not getting a street view. Or I'm dumb. I don't want location access. So many Teslas in the parking lot? Yeah, that's strange, huh? Let's take a look. Oh, there is an Ace of Sandwiches. Somebody said there's a sandwich shop across the street. Literally, this is probably where we'd park, at the sandwich shop. So somebody said that uh, Strava is a a pile of data. Uh, well, if you've got, you've got information, submit it for us, man. Drag and drop the little dude. This guy, is that all you do? I'm so bad at this. You guys are expert level. Next expert. All right. Can we get into this area here? Doesn't look like it. No. So what can we see from the street? Doesn't look like a bunch here. It's definitely Tesla, right? And uh, sometimes when we're doing this, uh, sometimes buildings are new and you won't even show up on 
on uh, Google Maps. You'll have to look at other locations. Some sites are pay to play when it comes to satellite information. Uh, we did a a building physical of a building that just got built and wasn't anywhere, but we were able to find the information through a different satellite. Uh, but some of them are pay to play, but just know that Google Earth is not the only satellite. What are the chances this is a Tesla? It's not a Tesla. Darn. Uh, we can form around the backside, see if there's anything over here down the street. Yeah, you really can't see a ton. There's not a ton of information here. That's a budget car. Where are the chances you can see parking tags? I don't know. It's a good question. So we don't see any sort of like big security, which is a, a good sign if you're doing a physical, right? They probably have badging in and out. Um, I'm sure they have like a big security presence when it comes to the front door area. They may have some sort of two factor or anything where you need to get into anything of interest, right? Um, but in terms of having to drive through and talk to a security guard to get past the gate, I didn't see anything like that. I don't see any kind of crazy fencing. What are the chances they have guest Wi-Fi? They might. I would think they take their security pretty seriously, especially being on platforms like Bug Crowd or Hacker One, whatever they're on. Um, but you know, you can't just judge them and say, yeah, for sure that they're going to be safe. But all right. That is true. Date timestamp might be important here. This is from December 2017. So what has happened in two years? So we could take satellite images. We can try this, right? And if we put this address in and we say satellite... Let's see. I don't know all the good sites. I just have to come come across them. If you know a good site, let me know. See, these images are from November 10th to December 2013. And this isn't, uh, this is Microsoft Bing. So yeah, their security presence could have increased. Maybe even likely did increase. Right, so Tesla was more coming around, not as popular at that time. Uh, so things to think about. But we'll move on. We won't stay too long with satellite images because we're uh, we're not doing a physical test of Tesla. Um, so we could go back to let's say people. And let's just pick a name out of here. Let's pick this guy. He's got a kind of unique name or the Stephanie has a McCandles or McCandless. I don't know. I like McCandles. We could search for him. We could say, looks like this is actually more common than we thought.
pick a different name. Huh, <laughs> Nikola Tesla, nice. We could email that address. That's actually pretty funny. Was that an article about a guy stabbing? Okay, guys. Where do you see a stabbing of a horse? And all right. Does not work at Tesla, doesn't look like. Used to work at Tesla. Oh no, she still does. Lead customer experience specialist. So probably not a high target, right? But the high targets aren't the ones we're always going to be after either. So we might be able to find some information um, from someone like her if we look at her um, if we look at like her Twitter or her Facebook or something along those lines. And she looks completely different. What are the chances, man, that she has the same name as an actress or whoever else with that unique? Oh, we're going to get into some Google hacking. Well, she's a client service representative. Let's not judge her income. We won't spend too much time, uh, too much time on people either. So if you guys find anything interesting in terms of people, let me know. There's a lot more tools that we need to go through before the night is over. Um, but while we're on the topic of, of this Google Foo or Google hacking, there's a bunch which most of you are probably very familiar with. Um, but let's say, for example, we want to search for Tesla. And we say, okay, well, we found Tesla.com. Let's search Tesla.com, but let's say we want to find, um, well, let's say we want to find information on that site and only the site of Tesla.com, right? We could say site Tesla.com. Okay, and then we come in here and you see a lot of www.tesla.com and we can get all these directories that are in here. Um, but what if we want to see maybe some sort of subdirectories? Uh, we don't want to see any of the www. We could take out the www with the minus www. And now we get other subdirectories, right? We get ir.tesla.com, forms.tesla.com. A lot of forms and we could start minimizing this maybe we don't want to see forms we can take out forms.tesla.com um, so we can we can do things like this we can also look for interesting docs right so we could say file type PDF and only look for PDFs that were put out Sometimes you get interesting information that's left behind. How many PDFs does Tesla have? Tesla has 3,290 PDFs. Um, but who knows what they may have accidentally put on there, right? Uh, say, for example, you might see financial statements you weren't supposed to or client information you weren't supposed to or some sort of sensitive information. Just as an example, uh, DocX is a good one to look at. It uh, looks like Sick in the Mind just posted a pretty long file type one. That's pretty good. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting file types to look for and just things to think about. Uh, other than looking for files and people, we can use other tools that are built in already. So we talked about the harvester a little bit. Uh, let's just 
type in the harvester like this. Now, if you run it by default, it's gonna want API keys, uh, which we don't have at the moment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill out the old fashioned way. Or if you actually run it with uh, a dash all, which is an option here, then it's gonna want the, uh, the hunter.io, these ones, the API key to actually search. So let's just take one of the examples that are here. Let's say we wanna search the harvester and we wanna do a domain of tesla.com. We want a length of 500 searches through Google. And let's just see what it pulls up. And this'll take a minute. Hey Nanjo, how's it going? Okay, so it looked through it. It found some emails, um, potential targets here, just gathering information. It also found some web addresses. Look, it found some more subdomains, edr.tesla.com, employeefeedback.tesla.com. We see the forms that we found, IR, shop, energy support. Um, we might find something, again, interesting in these subdomains, right? Like a dev.tesla.com. That might be interesting. Um, these types of environments. Uh, we might find an interesting email like help desk or something, you know, that might be interesting to us at some point. Uh, it's all about the information gathering at this point, as much information that we can gather uh, to perform our attack. Now, when it comes to doing penetration testing, which is more of what this course uh, revolves around, we're not going to be doing a ton of this in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, the, the things I showed you when it came to searching through breach password lists, that's definitely something you're, you're going to do in a day-to-day. -day. Uh, if you're doing social engineering engagements, depending on where you go, if you're doing network pen testing, you're probably not going to be touching this kind of stuff. Um, but if you do move into social engineering engagements, you go to a true red team, uh, this is where information gathering and mapping out and stuff becomes important. Uh, so the things that I'm showing you, the things you're learning... You may not see again for a long time, um, but it's still useful information to know how to search for things. Uh, but Google is probably far and away your best friend, but there are definitely tools built like this out there to help you sort through these things. Um, another one that we've touched on and talked about is have I been pwned, right? Say have I been pwned like this. If you haven't heard about this, this is a good thing to sign up for. Uh, you can search your email address in here to see if you have been pwned uh, and what breaches you've been a part of. Now, there are tools that are out there that will allow us to search through Have I Been Pwned list to see um, if the user that we search has been pwned. But let's take, for example, um, one of the emails that we just found. We've got Todd at Tesla.com. Let's just try him. This is just for conceptual theory. This isn't for, hey, this is the best uh, method. Obviously, if we searched every single Tesla address like this, it would take forever. That's why there's tools out there. Oh, no, Todd has been pwned. Todd was pwned in July of 2018 in the Apollo breach. That was quick, wasn't it? So it looks like he has some information out there. Now, if we were to go find an updated list or if somebody has his hash and cracked his hash and updates like those clear text password lists, um, then this becomes dangerous, right? So uh, wasn't expecting to find that, but that's a great first example to grab and see. And this is pretty recent. Um, thank you for the sub resume thread. I appreciate that. Uh, so things like this critical to look for, right? Hey, Nate dog. How's it going, man? So there's a tool that kind of does this for us 
called Bluto. I've had some issues getting it to work on this machine. Um, I'm going to show you how to install it. Maybe you'll have better luck than I do. And what we're going to do and what it does is it looks through have I been pwned information. It does some active recon. Um, it does try to do like zone transfers, things like that, where it's trying to get more information. Uh, so be aware that we are actually hitting the site. There will do some brute forcing as well. So be aware of that. Um, because Tesla is on the bug bounty program, I'm not concerned about it, but don't just up and run this against any site because uh, you will generate some noise. Uh, so if you want to install Bluto, the command is just pip install Bluto like this. It is already known by pip. Mine is already installed. Um, so when I went to run it yesterday, I was testing it out because I don't have it. This is my student computer. This is the one I use for you guys. Um, when I went to test it out, it was broken. So if we type in Bluto, let's see, I did fix it. Let me control C. Okay, so if yours, when you type in Bluto does not work, it may something say something along the lines of an error on the module named all file. O-L-E-F-I-L-E. -E. Uh, you should be able to fix this through the lessons that we have had uh, in the last few weeks. But if you look at the file that was of issue, which I'll type out for you guys in case you're watching this later or following along now, this is the directory. And we're gonna edit this datamine.py. And I'll bring this up for you guys. I'll let you guys uh, look at it for a minute. So you see this old file, and here's the directory. So originally, it had something in here where it was importing um, it was importing something else as old file. Basically, we don't need that. We can just straight up import old file, O-L-E, however you say it, um, and it'll be fine. So make this change to whatever the import originally was to this import, and it will be fine uh, and start functioning. Uh, just make sure you make that little notation there. And then once you do that, let's also go and check out the Bluto GitHub real quick. So if we say Bluto GitHub, and it looks like there's actually two which is interesting. I didn't know what the difference is. Six months ago, four years ago. All right, well, six months ago it is, right? Okay, so it's a DNS recon, brute forcer, DNS zone transfer, wildcard checks, all kinds of stuff, right? It does do active work, brute forcing, zone transfer. So make sure that you know that, as I said, going in. We come in through here, you can see what type of information you can use. Um, so here's some example. They provided an email hunter API key until e it's been removed. Who knows, I have never tried this, but you can use an API for email hunter. Um, you can say Bluto-domain, also use an API. The dash E uses a very large subdomain list for brute forcing, so if you want to brute force. Gives you the install instructions if you need to. And then it has some change log information here. So we're going to run this. Um, it hung for me last time I ran it, but we can run it again. Maybe you'll have better luck. This is a useful tool if you can get it working. I don't know if it's an issue with the 2019.1 that's on right now, but it works fine on the computer that I have. Uh, so if we just type in Bluto and we say tesla.com, The points are for raffles, Davey. Unless you're just trying to get rid of them all. Is search term sufficient? Just say yes. Okay. So, some things it does for us. Uh, it looks through the name servers, right? This is doing our uh, DNS recon, essentially. It's finding the name servers. 
It's finding like an NS lookup essentially where it's doing the IP address scheme for the name servers. Uh, it's found the mail servers here. It goes into Netcraft, which I haven't shown you Netcraft yet, but if you're looking for subdomains, Netcraft is an interesting one. It attempts to do a zone transfer. Now, zone transfers are not common. I have never seen one out in the wild. It should still be something that you should know. Um, but basically, if you're able to do a DNS zone transfer, you are able to uh, get a bunch of subdomains and more information. It's not, it's, a, it's not really an exploit, but it's kind of a vulnerability, I guess. It, it just allows for more information gathering for us. Um, but we don't have that here. Uh, tests for wildcards. Wildcards are not in place. Now it's going to gather data from Google, Bing, and LinkedIn. It looks like we're having some issues with search.py. It's having an issue finding this document for Bing here. Um, so there may be some issues that are, are conflicting with either 2019.1 uh, or there's just something in the build that's not working correctly. And we didn't supply a Hunter API key, so we didn't increase our identified email account, but we can also just go search the website like we did. Uh, so things that we can do, we'll let this run, see where we get. It does download some data for us as well. It should check through, have I been pwned? Let's see if this one does it. And I could be on an older one, but yeah, it does do for, look for compromised account enumeration, uh, staff enumeration, a lot of things. So this is a great all-in-one tool to just kind of look around and see if you can get any more information than you already have. Uh, so when it comes down to uh, looking for subdomains, I listed a bunch of tools earlier like Sublister, uh, but we can also use some things like Netcraft uh, or cert.sh. Let's look at cert.sh first, crt.sh. So this is the kind of the newer way to find subdomains um, is looking through these, these certificates. Um, actually, I attended a talk, a local talk, where somebody had built a little script to do just this, and it was finding um, not just subdomains, but interesting information based on those subdomains. Uh, it was actually pretty cool. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to supply a wildcard, which you can see is identified as a percent over here. And we're gonna just say wildcard.tesla.com. And we're gonna hit search. And if we come through here, uh, let me increase the size. It looks a little small on my screen through the, uh, the live stream. Okay, so we get some more here. We get employeefeedback.tesla.com, feedback.tesla.com. And you see the cert certificate information, right? my.tesla.com, static.tesla.com, um, sso-dev.tesla.com, SSO sso.tesla.com. Uh, we can copy this one. This would be something that, that would be interesting, right? I don't know what it is. We may not even get access to it since it's single sign-on. Yeah, we have no connection. Uh, but it exists or did exist, right? So these are the kind of things we want to look for. Image.emails, Cisco guest.tesla.com, API toolbox. Let's try that. Cisco guest. Nothing. We get the old AT&T search page. Okay, let's see. Let me take a drink real quick. My mouth is drying out. Also, cheers while we're at it. All right, guys. Heat, sir. That is probably my favorite meme, and that's all thanks to Twitch. And Davey. Davey helped create that meme and make it a thing. All right. 
So let's talk a little bit about fingerprinting. Let's look at some tools that we can use um, and some just some things we can do here. So one of the tools that I like to use, let's look at Wappalizer. And if we just say download and install, I actually haven't installed it. We have Firefox, so let's just do that. We'll add it to our Firefox here. Add, okay. And here you go, this is our Wappalizer. So now let's go to tesla.com on this. Let's see what they're running on. So they've got some sort of JavaScript framework running, tween max. They're using jQuery 1.12.4, uh, HTTP2. They've got Amazon Web Services. Looks like they're running an Apache web server. They're doing Amazon load balancing, and they've got Google Tag Manager. I don't know how Heist is running so much anyways. I did put a rate limit on it, but apparently that's not the case. So maybe I'll have to rate limit a little bit more. But this is some interesting things to look at here. We can kind of get an idea of what's running on the front end, what's running on the back end. Now they could, in theory, put false information in the headers or whatever and try to uh, throw us for a loop, right? But we could see like jQuery 1.12.4. Well, I might want to look up jQuery 1.12.4 and see if there's any vulnerabilities with this. There's been vulnerabilities with jQuery in the past. Uh, same thing with this tween max 2.0.0. Might want to look those up. Now, it really depends on what you're doing. Since this is a network-focused course and not a web app-focused course, a lot of the time we're worried about the host itself. Um, like I, for example, if we're doing a host and it's on an external and they give us, um, say they give us 10 machines, one of the machines happens to be a web server for their website. Uh, I'm not going to go on the website looking for web vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm not going to be looking for like reflected cross-site scripting, right? Now, I may test SQL injection on a login to see if I can get into their system if it's just a login page, if I can do any sort of bypassing, if there's remote code execution. My goal as a network penetration tester when I'm given a host like that is to find a way in through some sort of code execution. Um, if I find some really critical vulnerability with the web page, maybe, but I'm not looking for it. Um, but if I have a login or some way to give in, technically or typically you're not given credentials um, for these unless you're doing an, an external pen test and a web app. Now on web apps, a lot of times you'll get the website and you'll get to do the host that's hosting that website. And that's a little bit different because you're doing like a two in one. Um, but do keep in mind that if you're tasked to do a network pen test, keep in the scope that you don't want to waste all your time trying to pen test a website when that's not really the scope of things. So that is the end of my spiel. Sorry. Okay, so information here. Um, we can use other tools as well. Let me pull up my syntax because I don't remember all this, guys. Uh, okay, so we can use WhatWeb. So let's check out WhatWeb. We'll just say dash V and we'll say tesla.com like that. And it should run against it. Now this borderlines to me as active scanning. Um, this isn't necessarily passive recon anymore. So we're kind of diving into the deep end a little bit where we shouldn't be. Uh, timeout execution expired. Well, maybe we're not going to use what web. I'm not sure what's going on there. Way back in old bounty reports, 
is 100% true as well. Thank you, Davey. I will note that. Um, so you could go to the Wayback Machine, see what uh, they've had on there in the past. And you also could look at old bug bounty reports if you look through Hacker One or whatever and look for what kind of vulnerabilities they had before. There's a chance that maybe that's still lurking around in other places. Um, and you also get a decent idea of what their infrastructure was in the past. Okay, what web worked for somebody else? Well, that's good. It said IP. Why does it hate me? Look at the help. So we did a verbose. Enter URLs, host names, IP addresses, or NMAP format IP ranges. Uh, all right, maybe I give it an HTTPS. Other than that, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm not going to try to troubleshoot what my issue is. Ah. I got nothing, guys. It hates me. Everything about me. Well, at least it's working for you. Okay, other people are saying my syntax worked for them, so good for you guys. Uh, so other tools we can use, we can use built with is another tool and that's a website. Now there, uh, shout out to Tim Tomes. Uh, I did attend one of his web app classes last year and he really turned me on to the idea of being able to, uh, really fingerprint and almost scan without scanning a website or, a, you know, like a domain. So there are, there are sites out there that will tell you information without you ever being associated with scanning that site. Uh, this even goes out to open ports and things like that. Uh, so it's really kind of cool that you don't have to associate your IP if you don't want to, if you want to do data digging other ways as well. So let's take a look at built with. Yeah, they're going to see a lot of increased traffic. And they're going to be like, what the hell is going on? And somebody's going to point them to the stream, and then I'm going to get sued. And there's not going to be any more of our, uh, of our hacker streams, guys. All right. Builtwith.com. And we'll just search Tesla.com. Can I get sued for this? I don't think so. I'm just being dramatic. Cookies in jail would be good, though. Okay. So there's a whole lot of junk in here that we have to sift through. But it kind of tells us some of the things that might be interesting they're using. Salesforce. Uh, something called Crazy Egg. Google Analytics. They've got widgets. Salesforce widget. Obviously, they're on Bug Crowd. That shows up here. They're on Twitter. Qualtrics. Some mobile information, content delivery, payment information. They've got a content management system of Adobe and Drupal. I mean, there's a lot of information in here that you can dig up. And we never had to go onto their site. They've got a ton of different email hosting providers, which is interesting. So, looks like they got proof point for email security. So, I mean, this is all all very very useful. Shows who their SSLs are through, their name servers are through. So, I mean, you could go through this and try to pick up um, a way to really map them out and what they're using. Yeah, email security. I've gotten past proof point enough times in my life. Okay, so we are at a point now where we have gathered quite a bit of information. 
Um, is there information that you guys have gathered for me? Has anybody gathered? I'm just curious more than anything. The what web scan scanned a totally different website for you? Well, that's not reliable. You found the CEO's name. Oh, man. It appears they built some kind of car. You guys are a bunch of jokers. Let's see where we're at. So gathered some metadata for mining. Data downloaded. 324 megabytes. It's quite a bit of data. Is anybody past this point in their Bluto? Has anybody's Bluto got past the brute forcing of subdomains? What exactly are we brute forcing? So what it's doing is it's taking a list... Um, and it's brute forcing the subdomain. So it might have uh, just a common word list, like say like careers.tesla.com. Uh, so it's going to go through the list and see what resolves and what doesn't. You guys want to social engineer me? You guys are on my Instagram earlier. Got kicked off by the VPN. Is that bad? I don't know if this has anything to do with your uh, your VPN kicking you off. Yeah, definitely download the password list. You're more than welcome to use my script, improve my script. Give some credit where credit's due. Don't just steal the script, even though it's terrible. It's not hitting a login field, Jake. So what's happening is it's searching the subdomains and it's looking for a response code, right? So there's different HTTP response codes. So if it 404s, then, uh, then it's no good, right? But if it gives us a 200, then it's, it's likely good. If it gives us a 302, a redirect, then maybe it, it's good. Maybe it's bad. We'd have to check into it. What was the line we needed to correct on Bluto? It is for the OLE. There should be something about OLE. OLE file. Did you catch that? Good. All right. I think I've shown you guys pretty much enough for you to get the idea of what we're doing. Like I said uh, at, during the little PowerPoint, we're not going to cover all the tools or probably even a quarter of the tools. Uh, but what we're doing is identifying some of the processes that we would do. And really the takeaway is that information gathering is important. Um, finding the breach password list like we did, that's going to become really important on assessments. Uh, so I will, when we get into that in our later episodes, you'll, you'll see how we can actually exploit that. Um, but just keep thinking about these things. Think about information gathering. If you're ever asked to do physical assessment, think about looking at Google Maps, satellites, doing some sort of recon, going through pictures. Um, Twitter and Facebook are insanely good for just finding these pictures of badges or desks or anything that you can. Uh, if you're doing red team assessments, you get a lot more time to do those sorts of things. Um, but when you're doing like a limited penetration test with the time limit and everything else, um, it's really it's hard to do the true information gathering, depending on how big a company is that you would want to do. So, but these are some things to think about trying to find um, as much information as possible, doing target validation, fingerprinting, finding subdomains, breach data, etc. So with that all being said, I'm going to pop my happy face back on the camera. And we're going to go ahead and just cut into the AMA and chat. 
So feel free to ask me anything. My phone went crazy, so I'm going to check that real quick. So Davey really did tweet Elon Musk. That is not a lie. <laughs> Would I rather be ketchup or mayo? Uh, ketchup by far. Mayo is disgusting. My hair is crazy. It's a bad hair day. Look at that. Not enough product needs to be stiffer. Mayo is disgusting. Prove me wrong. Am I going to do the AWAE? I am not. It's a little too rich for my blood. I also am doing the WAPT X through eLearn Security, uh, which I feel is sufficient enough. So I have actually until the middle of May to take that exam and I haven't even studied for it the proper amount of time I needed to. So, um, with as crazy as everything is this month, I might actually have to extend that exam, which I've never had to do before. How long have I been learning for? Uh, Cali was my first distro to add on top of that. And I've been learning for, I guess if we're talking it terms, three years my first it job was help desk and that was in december of 2015 yeah so a little over three years is wapped x way more hardcore than wapped uh yeah it's a whole different beast I'm I'm glad I purchased wap first I thought I knew a lot in terms of um in terms of I guess web app and then I purchased WAP and realized I didn't learn as or I didn't know as much as I had hoped I knew. Um so big shout out there. And WAPDEX is a whole different beast. It's all manual. It's it's a whole different thing. And from what I've heard on the exam, you have to find all the findings, not just some of the findings. Would I rather be a top scientist in your field or get mad cow disease? I I would rather be a top scientist, unless this is leading down some sort of trick. Is there a way to catch my talk at the end of the month? Um, I don't know if it'll be live streamed. It will probably be recorded. I would hope it would be recorded. Um, they've recorded in the past, so that's up to, to them. But what I'm going to plan on doing is I'm planning on recording or doing a Twitch live stream my talk just so I can get comfortable with speaking through it and having an audience and getting some critiques on what you guys like or don't like. I still have to build that out. And I don't know how I'm going to do that because I have uh, obligations starting tomorrow through the weekend and I have obligations starting next Thursday through the weekend. So who knows? But uh, I'll probably do a demo around that Monday of that week. Did I major in computer science? I majored in accounting in undergrad, then my... Masters is a MBA in computer information systems. So yeah, I was an accountant for four years. I don't know what Black Duck is or why I'm the human version of that. How would you do a reverse shell through a VPN? I would just recommend using a bind shell instead of using a reverse shell. If you're in that situation, there's no need to reverse into you if you can bind. Is OSWP worth getting through HR filters? I don't think it's ever helped me in my career one time. Like... When it comes to HR, I don't think it's ever helped. My boss likes it, but my boss is old school. Um, but I think, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, you could read a five-minute blog post and learn the relevant information when it comes to pen testing wireless. 
That's just being honest. Wireless isn't that bad. If you're if you're just running WPA2 personal, it just depends on how hard your or complex your password is. It's all it comes down to. We got a lot of people coming to Carolina Con. Yeah, Gray's gonna be there. I didn't know you're gonna be there, Rumham. I, I didn't realize if you were coming or not. Uh, Spicy was in here earlier. Spicy said he's coming. So there's quite a few. Thanks, Chicken. I appreciate that, man. Uh, static source code scanner. I've never heard of it. The only source code scanner, I don't even, Veracode is the only one I've heard of or seen. So we are doing the CTF. I'm going to be doing the CTF. Um, it's on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Would I do walkthroughs for Hack the Box? Yeah, I've done retired boxes already before. Um, when I did them on here, it was more for like a learning purpose or easy, easy purpose, I guess, of trying to teach. They were the easier boxes. I've got some of the more complex walkthroughs on veteransec.com. You can check that out. There's a link down below to that or on YouTube as well. If you want to check those out, uh, to read some of those walkthroughs, but I don't do hack the box walkthroughs anymore. Can we do examples of SSH reverse tunneling? We're going to get to pivoting and stuff like that. Um, and tunneling, all that stuff, fancy stuff, way towards the end of the class. Way towards the end. And pivoting and tunneling are still things that is hard to wrap my mind around a lot of the times. It's not something, some people just get it. And I think other people just struggle like with understanding the concepts. It all comes down to syntax and just, you know, trying to wrap your head around it. The easiest Easiest tunneling I've ever done um, was with Cobalt Strike. It's literally like point and click. Will I be at DEF CON this year? I don't know if I'll ever go to DEF CON again unless for some reason we have like a gathering for, for VETSEC or something and I'm forced to go. But otherwise, um, I just it was, I call it Lion Con. It was just too big. Too many people, um, not enough space, and the lines for everything were so long that it wasn't worth even attending a lot of the talks or going to like the social engineering um, area or any of that, you know. So for me, it, it really wasn't a as good of an experience as I'd hoped. What are my favorite post exploitation frameworks? I am the Metasploit fanboy Homer, whatever you want to call me. I love it, man. It's got everything built in already. So if I can get a shell up to any sort of interpreter shell, that's that's my first game plan. Um, so if I can get it, because it's got Mimi Cats, it's got Kiwi, it's got Incognito, it's got post exploitation tools. It's got everything built in that you would want to have built in. It's got hash dumping. Like, I mean, it's got easy upload, download. There's so much stuff that it can do that's so flexible. I am a fanboy homer all the time. Do I use Cobalt Strike? Wait, sorry. I read ahead without seeing that. Uh, I've seen people get fired for doing the SSA China thing. Do the things like stream music at work. Uh, okay, do we use Cobalt Strike on a day-to-day -day basis? No, not, we don't. Um, I use mostly either open source tools or, you know, MMAP. We have a Cobalt Strike license. I'm just not a fan of it as much. Uh, some people live and die by it. It's just your personal preference, but we... I don't use it personally. The team has the license, though. Let's start our own con, MentorCon. I don't, I don't think enough people would attend MentorCon. 
what conferences do I plan on attending? What conferences do I recommend? Um, your local B sides are always good, even if it's just to meet people. Uh, so I always recommend local B sides just because you get to know the who's who of your area, maybe give a talk, meet other people and network. Um, you never know where a job might come out of that or some opportunity might come out of that if you're looking for one. Um, on the bigger scale, you would have to do your research on what sounds interesting to you. I would say DerbyCon. DerbyCon's ending this year. I've never been to there. Um, there's some other cons like like just the not so big or the ones that are limited in ticket. Like um, I hear ShmooCon's pretty, pretty good. Um, I haven't had a chance to go to those ones, so I can't really say if they're good or not. But like uh, for me, a con that has... Uh, I, I don't know, like um, unlimited amount of tickets that sells, it just becomes so overwhelming. You kind of want one that respects the amount of space it has and then allows you to get into areas um, and get to see everything. Yeah, sick of the mind. It's basically like Disneyland for hackers. <laughs> Some of the lines were, were at least an hour long, at least, and I'm just not going to wait. What's my plans after Zero to Hero? I'm not sure. Zero to Hero is going to last at least another three months. Is my guess. This is going to go at least 16 weeks. Um, if it goes less than 16 weeks, I would be surprised. But I haven't thought out that far. There, I was talking today in the Discord that we've got talks about having some guest streamers come on, maybe like on a Monday. And uh, I'm in talks with one right now where hopefully... Um, get some reverse engineering. He's doing his OSCE and he wants to do some some teaching. So ho hopefully soon we're going to do that. Um, so I'm, maybe we can get some more people on that can teach more diverse topics that are not just straight hacking uh, and kind of have a diverse learning group if we can. I think that would be cool. Yeah, it's the guy with the purple monkey, whatever you want to call that. It's Rory. Rory's going to be teaching a, a lesson here very soon. So... Um, I got to reach out and build better, I guess, better relationships with some of the community and content people to see. Um, I think since a lot of the content creators already have their own thing, they probably won't come over and do guest streaming. But um, maybe some of the some of the other guys that are more advanced in their field and just want to do a lesson or a talk or prep for a talk, even this may be a good place for them. Um, so hopefully we're going to do that. I've got a uh, a stream that we're planning out or at least um, some sort of AMA with another pen tester that's in the field and another content creator. So hopefully that'll that'll go well as well. Just things in the pipeline, um, but haven't thought as far ahead as what we're going to do after Zero to Hero. Um, I may take some time and actually uh, redo everything in Zero to Hero in a YouTube format so that it's in a very concise um, form of video and lesson coursework. Uh, but this will help Doing this course will help me create that course and maybe even write a very long lesson plan or guide or notebook or something uh, to tie in with it and create uh, like my holy grail or my gift to the community in terms of this zero to hero. So I definitely have I have ambitions and goals to to do these things. Um, it's just all very going to be time consuming and. How's it going, Gray Skull? So I'm a little behind on these. Yes, DerbyCon did die because of adults not acting like adults. Any thought of having live bug bounty hunting? So the only platform that I'm on, there's two things. One is like, I think on the obvious for me is if I'm hunting a bug and you see me hunting the bug, somebody might snipe that or, you know, watch me do it, then write the report and take it as their own. Um, number two, the one and only platform that I even bug bounty hunt on is Synac. And, um, that's all NDA type work where you can't even tell who the clients are, or any of that stuff. So it's very secretive. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to do that anyway. There's a lot of rules against that.
VOD retention will be tough. I don't know what the VOD retention is for for Twitch, but I've been storing everything on YouTube as well, so the retention will be there at least. Have I been in Hackersploit's Discord? I have not. What's my stream schedule? The tech stuff's on Wednesdays. Um, I haven't done any video game streaming just because I've been so busy with work and um, all these obligations. Like this month is probably the busiest month of, for me this year. It's just everything is happening at once kind of month. Um, so hopefully into May, I might be able to stream a little bit more. I've got a lot of plans and things just like maybe doing some kind of IT hacker related, but not like technical um, streams that that might be fun too. Hey wife, how are you doing? My wife just got home, I think. The dogs went crazy. And now she's stalking my my stream. 60 days for VODs. Well, that's good. At least they'll they'll be saved on YouTube. And then hopefully I can make a, a nice concise version when we're done. Thanks, JBL. Appreciate you, man. Q2 funding finally kicked in. Yeah. Yeah, it kicked in. It's uh it's crazy right now. I mean, we <laughs> we we're just getting hit left and right with all these these pen tests that were like pushed out and then now they're they're hitting all at once. So um just how like having vacation last week, I have a friend coming into town this week that I haven't seen in 4 years, 5 years. Um, and then next week I'll be on vacation again and it's just the wrong month to take vacation. Apparently uh, I thought I was going to have some time off, but like everything now I've got pen tests that I've got to cram and actually get done. Um, I had PTO scheduled for Friday, but now I've, I'm going to hit my 40 hours by tomorrow. Um, so not a lot of sleep, not a lot of anything. It's just, it's a lot of work right now, unfortunately. Any any news on the kitties? They get to opt out. No, we still got three. So because of all the vacation that we're doing right now, um, they are. We don't want to give away two of them and just have one like locked up while we're gone, kind of deal. Just because they're so young, so we're keeping them together until until we get back from the the next vacation. Um, but I mean, they're like they're big. They're two hand big already, which is insane. Had a phone call with a company that purely does bank pen testing. Problem is they would only bring me in a 1099 contractor. Folks at VetSec Slack explained why that kind of sucks. What's my opinion? Um, it does kind of suck. I would never contract because you have to buy your own insurance. You don't have any of the perks or benefits of being like a PTO, uh, any of that time off. And I'm pretty sure you don't have like the, you can just get canned at any time type deal. You don't have the job security. Um, so you would need a lot of money, like probably 40 or 50% more than what you would want in a desired salary anyway. Um, but I, I wouldn't do it. Like I would do it in a certain situation. And what we would do is like, if, say if I was working or had my own company, like that's, I know people that do this, have their own company and they 1099 on the side completely different because you have some income and stability in case something else happens. Um, you already have to have your own insurance anyways. So do a collab with live overflow. I wish live overflow would do a collab with me. I don't know what we would do. I'm not, uh, I'm not cool enough, but he does follow me on, on Twitter, which is cool. He's a really nice guy. I've talked to him. He's been in here once before and he's, it was really pleasant to talk to. Where's the cake at? We need to we need to make a cake. I talked to my wife about doing a Mary Berry cake baking stream. That would be fun. We do have the Mary Berry cookbook. Do we hire a kitty sitter? Uh, no kitty sitters. Wait. We've got um, family that's going to be able to watch them. Let me see this picture. 
Dude, I need a picture of Wednesday or I'm gonna think Wednesday died. Hello, Eternal Raven. She's not dead. I believe you. Or maybe I don't. I don't know. Good night, Leo. I feel like you need a kitten, Jake. I mean, you have the one grumpy cat, but I feel like you could use another cat that you can put shark suits on and stuff. We need some British tea to go with our cakes. Has to be gray. Well, lucky for you, we've got a gray one. Should we bring the gray one in here? Let me text the wife. He's kind of... He's kind of brownish, though. I guess he's not as gray. Well, bring in uh, Wesley. Right, meow. Night, Davy. Okay, Wednesday's looking majestic AF, dude. That cat's so pretty. I hear the wife. Hello? Hi. Oh, trying to get the cats away. Look at this behemoth. Look how much these, these fuckers have grown. He's more of a brown tabby. He's not gray. I kind of lied. But he's a sweetheart nonetheless. Hi, wife. Hi. Oh. How, how was your night out? Fine. How was yours? <laughs> night in? <laughs> My night in was great. Okay. <laughs> That's a nice fucking kitty. This one's perfect. All right, we'll have to we'll have to meet in the middle somewhere. That's like a thousand mile drive each way. Oh, sorry. There you go. Okay. Thanks. You're Bye. Okay. He's slightly crazy that one, but he's uh he's by far the biggest. He's been the biggest all along. Like he's been double the size of everybody else the entire time. You need a wife module? <laughs> the wives have their ups and downs. Pseudo switch user. Uh oh, she's still there. Busted. Busted. Money cannot buy you love. Money cannot. A couple hours, yeah. I wouldn't want to date with money because you'd always have in the back of your head that do they like you for you or do they like you for money, right? At least in my opinion. I'm self-conscious. Money can buy you somebody to take your OSCP cert for you. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> rich people problems. Eight hundred dollars. You going the cheap route? You doing the the thirty day? No sleep. That is a good point. Money does not equal happiness, but it does equal the ability to do some things spontaneously, which can lead to happiness. How much is a 60 day? I think the 60 day is like a grand. I don't know for sure. It's been a while. Thanks, Kate. I appreciate that. What certs do I have? Uh, let's see. I'll go in the order that I got them. A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, Linux+, plus, CEH+, CCNA, OSCP, OSWP, and the EWPT. Do I recommend renewing certs like CCNA security if you don't plan on using it? Um... No, I feel like you could list the CCNA security on your resume and just say that it expired. Only because if you don't, I've, I've said this before, but like if you don't want to be tied to Cisco stuff, I wouldn't continue having Cisco stuff. I don't plan on renewing my CCNA. I don't plan on like renewing my CEH. There's just certs that I'm going to let die. Um, even the CompTIAs I'm going to let die at some point. I'm I mean, it's just, it just is what it is. So at a certain point in your career, they don't matter as much. They're important to when you, when you want to get through some hurdles. Um, but there's some, you know, like some don't expire, which are great. Um, maybe like the CISSP you'll keep if you get that and keep going through. But other than that, like, um, as you mature in your career, you don't even really need them anymore. Which cert was my favorite? Mm, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I think the OSCP was fun. I don't know if it was my favorite. I think it helped push me to where I needed to get, or at least motivate me to where I needed to get, and, and taught me some stuff. Uh, in terms of like actually learning that, I feel is like most closely job related. I feel like uh, the the E, the WAP, the eLearn Security WAP was probably more job um, beneficial, if that makes sense. So I think there was more closely tied. Like after I did that, I was doing web assessments with confidence as opposed to like not knowing what the heck I was doing. So... How did the continuing education credits work for for which one, Jake? It's all free if you have a P card at work. This is true. I've not really paid for a certification yet, um, though that has changed kind of. There's a couple certifications I bought that I don't think are going to get recomped. 
Which cert did you find the hardest to get? Uh, so I spent the most time on the OSCP. I think it's probably the most difficult one. Uh, just in terms of the hours meant to study and the, the test. I didn't think the test was too, too bad. I could have easily gotten lucky on, on what I got in boxes. Um, but I didn't think it was too bad. I just think the amount of time and effort was would be the reason why it was the hardest to get. I've never taken a SANS course because I could never get anybody to pay for that, and I'm not paying for that out of pocket. But I do think that SANS does put out some good material. What's up, Zaltan? What's the highest certification I'm willing to get? Uh, I don't even know, man. I, I'm i probably done like with off-sex certs. Um, anything at this point would be to like learn into a field that's either more advanced or um, learn something I might be interested in on my own kind of deal. So I don't know, like, I... I don't know how many more certs I have left in me unless they come with the certification from the training as it is. Uh, I, I at some point have the CISSP in my future. I haven't been looking forward to it, but I'm going to get it out of the way. And that'll probably be the end in terms of the highest. Um, if the like I've got I purchased Aries, which is reverse engineering through eLearn security, and I've got PTX um, through eLearn security that I've got sitting on the back burner. Um, I've got an Active Directory course that I purchased from Pentest Academy that I've got sitting on the back burner. So like those are things that come with certifications that aren't really that well known, but it's just the training that I'm interested in, I think could help better myself or give me more knowledge. Um, but I think, I guess in terms of complexity or highest ranking would definitely be the CISSP. If I could ever get into a SANS course and somebody would pay for it, I would absolutely go. Don't get me wrong. I would absolutely love to go. Um, I just haven't gotten any any job that would pay that much money for a course. It's mostly government side or big, big firms. I don't have the EGA PT. I don't have the EC PPT. I think they're both great. Um, if you've seen any ones in the past, my basic advice on both of those, I think that path, I think, the, okay, so there's two paths you could take, EJPT into OSCP or the ECPPT, right? Um, I think the ECPPT is more current than the OSCP. I think it teaches more relevant material. However, you will not get through HR with that certification alone, so you'll probably still end up having to do the OSCP anyway. Um, so I think that it's important. There teaches some good stuff in there. Like I haven't done it myself. I've just looked at the syllabus, but from, from the syllabus, there's internal pen testing. Uh, it teaches you how to use responder. It talks about, uh, LLM and R poisoning with responder, right? It talks about NTLM relay, SMB relay. These are some things that are important that I never knew coming into my job. And thankfully they hired me, um, and trained me and taught me, but you know, like, like those little things that will give you a leg up in an interview, they're they're priceless. Hey, Alan from Hell Ninety. Uh, so we already did a lesson. You can catch the VOD later. It may be available some of it now if you want to go backtrack and watch it. Um, but we're doing the AMA after the lesson at this point. Pluralsight has beast moded their IT infosec courses. I'll have to check that. I haven't checked it. What is my guide to become a bug bounty hunter? Um, I don't do a lot of bug bounty hunting. If you're looking at it from a web app side. <laughs> okay, so here's my thoughts. Hacker one, um, whatever, you know, and, and, and the rest of them, bug crowd, etc. You're going against people tons of people it's an open program tons of people on the public side and if you do well enough on the public side you can get into the private programs which is more limited um, they've introduced that ctf where you can get private programs cool 
Um, but you're going against people that have been doing this forever, have scripts written out, are maybe masters of just even one area, and can find vulnerabilities in circles around you. It's good practice to try to find what you're looking for, but usually most of that meat has been picked off the bone unless you get a um, like a bug bounty from a client that just went live. Uh, so usually it's really hard to break in, I feel like. You have to have some sort of experience already doing pen tests, uh, but you can read up on pen testing, web app pen testing, and, and try to read some of the old Hacker One write-ups. Um, any of the bug bounty write-ups would be good. Just try to understand what's going on. I even look at bug bounty write-ups and I come across something interesting when I'm doing um, like my own web app pen testing. You can also look at Synac as well. Um, that's what I do because it's more private. So you have to go through, uh, you submit a resume, go through a written assessment, a practical assessment, and you do um, an interview, a background check, et cetera. It takes like five or six weeks but they have a lot of cool programs. It's very more limited. Uh, you get opportunity to um, to attack not only web, but host assessments as well. And there's just not as much competition. So I, I really like going through that process and um, being able to, you know, really weed out <laughs> all the other people that are out there attacking the same thing at once. It, it just depends on, on how you want to go. But um for me, I'm I'm not a big fan of, of the public bug bounties. Aside from money, is there any reason not to get the EJPT and the OSCP? I don't think so. I think they're both good career-wise. Where does one begin with reverse engineering? Um, there's a lot of information out there. You could do a course on it. You could look at like live overflows videos on it. You could purchase um, the book. I've got the one back here. Um, the Hacking, the Art of Exploitation. That's a good one. Uh, so just however you learn, if it's videos, then look up some sort of videos. If you'd like to read, then find a book that you would uh, want to get into it with. But um, it does start a lot with C++ and things like that, but learning assembly language and um, just understanding that. What's up, Steve? I'll have to check that out, sick of the mind. Thanks for that course recommendation. I actually have that that talk pulled up, Jake. I have been wanting to uh, to read that, or not read it, watch it. I've been I had it pulled up. I've I've played a little bit of it, but I haven't uh, watched the whole thing. I still got it up in my browser. Good night, Scott. I will post the parser script in the Discord. Don't you worry. No, go ahead and post the link if you want. I'm perfectly okay with that. Let me get my parser script downloaded, and then I will uh, get it for you. Stand by, stand by, finding it. And putting it into zero to hero now. Stand by. Cheers, it's uploaded. 
how old was I when I first started my certification? My first certification came at, oh God, I got to do math. 26. I did my A plus when I was 26. I'm 29 now for reference. I could post the Dakota Con talk. Give me one second. I've still got it pulled up. So the one he's referring to starts at somewhere in the five hour mark. Um, if you could help me out on that one. I'm not sure exactly where it starts. Thank you for the link, Sick. That's that's awesome. I will bookmark that as well. Cause my assembly could definitely be better. There's good references out there for web app. They just released that course uh, through, I think it's Port Swigger, right? Did it uh, just release the course? There's the web application uh, hackers handbook, which is still pretty relevant. Uh, E-learn security courses are relevant. They've got the offset course now. Uh, I would do the EJPT. I would skip to Security Plus if, if I had that preference. That's just if you're trying to get into pen testing, unless you're going DOD or something, something like that, like a government job. I don't know if the Security Plus is gonna be all that beneficial compared to the the pen testing stuff. You can figure out a lot of what the Security Plus teaches you by just reading up on like interview questions that you might see for security jobs. Even then, most pen testing interviews are about process. They're not really about um, like questions you would see on the uh, the Security Plus, like what cipher is is this or what cipher does that, you know. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. Flex the tats. I'm not stripping for you guys.
Your uncle's a pen tester? That's pretty cool. Guess I don't want to earn the donations. I guess not, huh? Single dollar bills, please only. And no touching. I've never had an auto mod hold a uh, hold a message before. I just allowed the word thought. It's okay with me. <laughs> no touching. Yeah, Neon knows. Touching's extra. Yeah, touching requires a Patreon sub. There you go. Diamond status. No, I'll never ask for a donation. I accept them, though. You guys are way too nice. You see some Twitch streamers requiring subs or donation amounts or whatever to do certain things. I think that's silly. I'm looking at the ASMR Twitch streamers, but I could be biased. It is the larger channels. You're 19, the sec plus might be seen useful, or might be useful, you're seen as noobs. Uh, I know some young, I know some young guys that are uh, up and comers in this field and they're doing just fine. Find an employer that wants to hire you for your skills and not because of your age or what you look like or, I mean, look, like, look at me, right? You want to flex the tattoos and stuff? I'm covered in tattoos. Like, it shouldn't matter how old you are, what gender you are, what race you are. It should matter what you can do and can you perform your job. That's it. That's all it comes down to. So I wouldn't be worried about what certification you should get because of your age. Worry about what certification you get if it's going to help you get the job you want to get. Thanks for the kind words, guys. Where do I practice pen testing? Mostly at work, if that's the question. Um, all the time. It's always all the time. That's why you, you got to be part of these communities, right? Like Discord channels, Slack channels, whatever you can get a part of, just to, to read what other people are posting, learn from them, learn from your coworkers, learn from Twitter, uh, practice when you can. It gets more and more time consuming as you uh, get deeper into this, but you just practice where you can practice. ASMR plus pen testing. I am down. Let's dim the lights, get some soft music going. Don't get your face tattooed. No plans on that. We were talking about that earlier. If I become a tattoo artist, I may f tattoo my face. That's just a heads up. Alternatives to hack the box. I don't really, I don't do a lot of hack the box or any of that anymore. Obviously everybody says Volnhub. There's like a wizard's lab or something that's out there now that I keep hearing about. Um, 
but I I haven't gotten into into that. Virtual hacking labs. Yeah, I'm probably canceling my VIP for for hack the box for now. I don't I don't use it. I've just been spending money on it for nothing. Dim the lights, pour the scotch, pwn the hack. I like it. Let's get some scotch in here. Is pen testing a strenuous job? I don't think so. Some people, okay, people find different things stressful. For me, I enjoy pen testing. I think it's a stress reliever. Like, literally, I get to do what I enjoy doing for work. So for me, it's it's not that stressful. There's there's situations you can be in where that are stressful, right? Like you could have um, like a bunch like where I'm in right now. I'm stressed out this week. I'm stressed out this month where I've just got back to back to back pen tests. I've got other obligations. I got vacations. So I don't have enough time to do everything. That gets stressful. But the work itself isn't stressful. I really enjoy doing it. Um, there's some things that may give you butterflies, like if you don't like social engineering or physical pen testing, that might stress some people out. Um, I know people that are unwilling to do that type of work because it stresses them out. Uh, but for the most part, if you enjoy the work, it shouldn't. But uh, everybody's different. I'm a baller, so I spend money on nothing. I spend money on stupid stuff or cool stuff. We just bought, I bought my wife Lego Bugatti for her birthday. That's a lot of money, but it's also super fucking cool. And I get to help build it. So it's kind of my birthday too. What was one of the most challenging engagements I've had? Um, so challenging in terms of difficult, I don't know. There's there's some that are just like you're you're just not going to get in, right? That that can be challenging mentally, I guess. Like you feel like everything should have an in and everything's vulnerable, and yeah, it is to a point. But if you're limited on scope or um, how you can do it, you know. Uh, that's one thing uh, for me I guess limited like in terms of engagement itself probably there was one when I first moved out here to Charlotte like I'd been working for the company for a few months but I first got out here we just moved in just getting settled and we were doing this client engagement that had uh, t at least 10 different types of assessments all different kinds of assessments and there were like two or three of us working on this at once and we were working this client around the clock for three weeks trying to meet this crazy deadline with a new report that they wanted specific uh, to them in a specific layout, everything else. So we were building something that was new, doing all this stuff and trying to accomplish other tasks that were coming along at the same time. So um, that was stressful but and challenging, um, but for its own aspect, I guess. I did see the Lego McLaren. Um, that was that was really cool because it only went like 20 miles an hour, right? Or something even really slow, like two miles an hour. Do I think uh, a pen tester earns more money than a web developer? Um, I would say yes. I would say yes, big time. I mean, what do you think a web developer makes? I don't know. Tell me some web developer salaries. I'll tell you if it if it does. But if I'm thinking they're like in the 80K to 100K range, I think the, uh, the pen test salaries are way higher than that. Pen test is like in the 100 to 200K range right now, depending on your level and where you're at. Low 60s in Dallas. Pen testers make bank. 
it just it, I don't know if it's a bubble. I don't know if it's going to explode, but right now there are more jobs than there are people. The supply and demand of economics is pushing the price up. And at some point, economics says that it's going to come back down. It's going to even out, find a point. We will have supply and demand met eventually, right? Um, when's that going to happen? What's that going to mean for jobs? I don't know. Um, but for right now, it's a good field to be in. It, it depends. So, Paul, for 200K, it depends on um, what market you're in, how senior level you are. Uh, so, like, if I took the same role I'm in and I moved to New York City or D.C., I would hope to make 200K. Uh, but if I wanted to, say, personally make 200K, I probably need to move into management or director level type work, and that's probably... I don't know, at least five to seven years of experience would be my guess. Um, but the the field, the cybersecurity is paying a ton of money. They just did a cyber survey maybe six months ago and polled everybody and what they were making anonymously. And the ones that were 200K, 300K, and we're not talking like New York City. We're talking like I saw a $300,000 salary in Charlotte, North Carolina. I mean, like that's not a high cost of living area. So there's a lot of big money out there right now. And uh, the the time to work it, you don't have to be a C-level executive to earn 200K in pen testing. Um, you don't have to go to a DOD sponsored college if you want to work for that. So my thought process, if you want to work for the, the government, you don't have to do the military. Uh, depending on where you go, college helps, especially if you're in like a GS program. So go to, go to college, get a degree. If you're doing, if you want to do security or any sort of cybersecurity and you want to be safe, get a degree in computer science. Um, master's degree even gets you a higher level of a GS when you come in. You could do the 8570 certs, like a Security Plus or the CEH, God forbid, um, and start doing that sort of stuff. You may be able to land an internship. Like when I worked at Sandia, uh, we had interns that were junior level or even below, and they were making pretty good money um, working part-time, like $25, $30 an hour as an intern. So uh, it's definitely possible, and you can find... Um, you can find these jobs. There's there's a ton of ton of work out there, especially if you can find somebody to sponsor a clearance. So if you want, uh, would a master's degree get you a better starting salary? Uh, for some fields, if we're talking government, yeah, it ups your GS level. What's my thought on a cybersecurity and forensics degree? Do you want to go into forensics? I don't I don't know a lot, and I'm not up to date, so I don't want to speak, um, I guess, out of line here. I don't know a lot of good programs in cybersecurity right now. I just don't. Like, uh, I, I worry for people that are going through cybersecurity degrees that they're not getting sufficient education that they need to come out of it. Uh, most employers are way more willing to take a computer science degree or background and train than they are to take somebody with a cybersecurity degree and hope that they can um, compete. I I get beat out by computer science backgrounds all the time. It just it just is what it is. It's the nature of the market. I've lost jobs because I didn't have a computer science degree. Is it really bad living in Charlotte, North Carolina? No, I don't. I don't know. It depends, I guess, where you live. I don't have any issues in my neighborhood. My neighborhood's quiet. Um, there's no crime. There's nothing. There's bad parts of every city you live in. Now, where I came from, Albuquerque, New Mexico, there 
in my opinion, is not a safe part of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Not one safe part. Most big cities like Charlotte, like you have your areas that are bad and stay away from, but typically you have suburbs that you can live in and people don't mess with you kind of deal. Uh, Albuquerque, you could pretty much get robbed wherever you were at. Didn't No house was safe. No car was safe. It's the number one property crime, number one uh, car theft in the country. And there's a big reason for that. So uh, moving here, I feel a lot safer. There's a lot more things to do, especially as a sports fan. Uh, we're close to close to Atlanta, close to other big cities. Asheville's a cool little town. You're close to the beach. You're close to the mountains. Um, a lot of major cities and things to do around here. We were a two-hour flight from New York City, um, seven-hour drive from D.C., even closer on the flight. There's a lot of things. This is a nice little hub right here. I have a master's degree, Willa. Woo, sport ball. I love sport ball. Did I do good in school? The correct term is did I do well in school? And does that answer your question that I can correct your grammar? Yeah, you got schooled, buddy. Did I do well? Yes, I did well in school. My first year, I I partied a little harder than I should have. Um, but my my GPA, I think my undergraduate GPA is like a 3.5, 3, and The master's is like a 3.7 and above. You heard Albuquerque had issues with a chemistry teacher a few years ago? Yeah, he's dead, though. He died. Rest in peace. Or maybe he's not dead. Maybe he'll come back in the movie. The longer you work in InfoSec is equivocal to the amount of alcohol I consume. Yeah. It could just be an age thing, too. Could be an age thing. My alcohol consumption has gone up as the years have gone by. Drink first, think later. I just got the notification that uh, the game is over. Dirk has played his last game. That makes me sad. That is my entire childhood, people. Uh, what do I think of Pentester Lab Pro? I've never used it. Couldn't tell you anything about it, unfortunately. If somebody here has has done it, please chime in. I haven't done it. Word on the street is, it's dope. Thanks, Kate. I'll let her know. I appreciate that. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for watching. 
you often have to use any log tampering techniques during engagements? I have never once dealt with log tampering. I think that falls more into like the red team side of things. I really do. What is the development and exploits and malware called? Which courses teach you that? Yeah, exploit development is what it's called. I would look up courses on exploit development. Would I ever do tutorials on forensics? Would I personally? No. My forensic skills uh, are limited to what I've done in Capture the Flag events and using volatility, and that's about it. Not very good. However, I would be open to somebody who works in the field giving a lesson on forensics um, via the stream. Like we talked about earlier, people doing streams absolutely would be interested in. I think that'd be great. Where would I go to point you to after passing the OSCP? I would look into um, internal pen testing, Active Directory environments. Start looking there. You're going to need it for interviews. Do I have a way to save the chat in a text file and put it on Discord? Uh, maybe. I don't know. There's a lot of good stuff in here. I could try. It, it only goes back so far that I know of. Uh, but the good thing is if you watch the video on demand, the chat is up on the side on Twitch. So if you watch the, the video on Twitch, you can see everything um, on the side. So if you do a play-by-play -play on that. I have not used Remnux. I don't know what that is. Sorry. I know a really talented guy in forensics. I don't know if I could get him to teach anything or if he'd be interested in teaching anything. Um, but he's got his own tools, platform stuff. He's a member of EdSec. I would have to reach out to him and see. getting sleepy his github let me look him up real quick i don't know if he has a github he sure does There you go. Look up Paul Henry on YouTube. Thanks, Bull. I appreciate that, man. It's almost time for my bedtime as well. I got a long day tomorrow. Yeah, I've caught... 
I've caught YouTube uh, putting the timestamp in a lot of videos now. Unless you're hitting the share, unfortunately. It's any video you watched before. Thanks, Saucy. I appreciate it, man. I'll probably do a hard stop here. Maybe 1045. Looks like everybody's going to sleep. All my Brits are going to sleep. Good night, status quo, quo status. How's my family cope with the long hours I spend on screen? Uh, I don't spend that long. So just, just the wife and pretty much I try to spend time with her when I can. She likes to watch video games. So if I play video games, she'll watch me play, which is nice. Uh, not a lot of, a lot of women are into that. So other than that, when I stream, she leaves me alone. Uh, but it's only one, one night a week. So it gives her some free time too. So we're not up each other's asses, I guess. Uh, but if this was a more consistent thing, maybe that would cause more issues, but it's not really that, that big of a deal for one night a week. Five AM go to sleep. Does she play overwatch? Uh, we tried that one time. I gave her mercy and told her just to hold down the heal button and it didn't work, it didn't work at all. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Given advice to stop going for the CSENT CCNA, just go for security plus if I want to get into security. Uh, yeah, maybe. Having the networking knowledge definitely helps in security. You don't have to have the CCNA to back it up, but it would help land an entry-level job, kind of, depending what you're doing. Uh, if you want to work like on a, on a SOC or anything like that, a CCNA looks good, a CCNA security looks good. Um, Security Plus is definitely useful if you're, I guess, if you're trying to break into the field, um, but it's not much useful after that. I still use Cisco. I use Cisco command line today for my, uh, for work. So, I mean, you never know when your CCNA is going to come in handy. Yeah, Jake, some, some people understand how to move some other people don't understand how to move my wife i also try to let her play rocket league and basically it was somehow staring at the ceiling while driving a car so yeah it's she'll be the first one to tell you she does not understand how to control <laughs> a character or a car fortnite's a great bonding game if you want the best bonding game, if you want a game that's going to test your relationship, you should play Overcooked. Play Overcooked, and you will either get divorced or it'll strengthen your relationship. You'll break up or it'll get better. Guaranteed to make you yell at each other, though. Guarantee it. Uh, there's nothing tough about stopping a live stream. The the thing is, the questions tend to pick up right as I say I'm going to go because people start to ask or come up with more questions, but it's not too bad. All right, Jake. Later, man. Enjoy food for me. I'm hungry, too.
Good night, guys. Good night, Kreskin. What sort of addictions do I entertain? Uh, that's a good question. It So for me, it comes in waves. It's whatever I like at the time I spend a lot of time on. So sometimes uh, my addictions are studying. Sometimes my addictions are playing video games. Uh, it, food. I always have uh, food addictions, I feel like. So I'm like constantly dieting because I'm... I feel like I'm fat by nature, but it's uh it's hard to keep weight off. I used to be used to be a bit heavier set before the military, but um food's definitely an addiction too, I guess. Think masters in cybersecurity is valuable? Uh I would still take a masters in computer science over that, but if you don't have that route prior to i think uh cybersecurity may help if it helps your job or if it it depends like is it like cybersecurity like um isso type work like is it just like information assurance what are you what are you doing then um it depends if it covers what you want to get into and helps you further in your career Sorry, I missed the router and switch attack question. Looks like somebody else answered it. Um, we get a lot of routers and switches put on there. Yeah, I guess. I mean, they're in the network when you, you come across them, but um, there's not a lot of attack surface usually. Maybe a login page. Um, if there's, like, some sort of known exploit, but you got to be careful, like somebody said, with, with taking down a network. Uh, so... Dirk highlights? Are there Dirk highlights? I saw he dropped 20 points. Uh, I didn't see everything else, though. Obviously, it wasn't as good as last night, so I don't know if he, he chucked up uh, chucked up as many shots as he did last night. Sorry, need a drink. Uh, how's pen testing changing with increased influence of platform as a service and infrastructure as a service? That's what I'm guessing that question is. Uh, I just think a, a lot of a lot of things are moving to the cloud right now, and it's it's becoming uh, yeah less responder. That's that's true. Um, it's just it's becoming more difficult to pen test. Um, some of the AWS pen tests that we've had uh, haven't haven't gone as well as I'd hoped. Um, I don't know if if it's because they're more secure or if it's just like if I'm not strong in that area yet or what it is, but um, it's changing the game in terms of security. I do feel like yeah, it's a good way of putting it. AWS has a lot more limitations to layer two. We did a, uh, one of the AWS, we did an internal external on uh, AWS, and that thing was locked down so hard. That was one of the most boring pen tests I've ever done. More open S3 buckets. I need to get into the cloud. I started studying for the AWS. That is, that was so boring to me. I'm not going to lie. I know that's where we're heading. I know it is. I got to suck it up at some point. They're free on Amazon. I did not know that.
I was using, what was it, A Cloud Guru? Which A Cloud Guru was good. I learned a lot of the, the high level overview. I've had to do some, I guess, second seat sitting on a, a cloud assessment in terms of like a infrastructure assessment for AWS, but not to the point where I would be comfortable doing it on my own by any means. But we are definitely moving in that direction. The AWS certs require you to renew every two years, but if you go look at what some of the highest paying certifications are right now, it's AWS. Like the lower tier certs pay 100K a year. It's just a hot commodity right now. Cloud's a hot commodity. And those, those certifications are not easy by any means. No, crypto transactions can be traced. I think you can use things like tumblers um, to try to avoid that. I don't, I don't deal with crypto at all, but I, that's my understanding. There's, there's tumblers out there, like services that'll, that you can pay to make the purchase for you, kind of deal. See, the trick is to spend more money uh, or save more money than you would have spent with shipping. But to do that, you have to buy more stuff on Amazon. That's awfully enthusiastic, MTX. Go ahead and uh, start studying for the AWS and come back to me in a week. Tell me how you feel about it. And then know that you have to renew everything that you just learned every two years. You got the solutions architect or whatever it is, the architect. Some people have the mind for it. Yeah, AWS does change every quarter. It takes a special person to like AWS. Just like it takes a special person to like Cisco or any of the specific vendors. It's a good area to have knowledge in. But you don't want to get too deep unless you actually like it. Oh, I, I'm all for Georgia Tech's program, all for it. That it's a top five program, and the 
acceptance rate is pretty, I think, are on the higher end. Um, but the the dropout rate's also on the high end because it is not easy by any means from everything I've heard. Uh, but if you can complete it and you can have that on your resume, it opens a lot of doors and looks very, very good. So I am fully for it. And the pricing and everything they're doing, they're doing everything right. It's not about money for them, and that's that's awesome. I did not see we don't have to submit requests for AWS for pen tests. You do for Azure. I can tell you that. We just had to submit one. Talking Georgia Tech, not talking AWS. What did I do in the Army? Uh, so I was enlisted first. I did um, dental specialist, basically. It was a 68 Echo. I was your friendly dentist assistant. And then I commissioned and was a health admin officer. So depending on what you do, you could either write a desk, you could work the line with the medics. Uh, it just depends on, on where they stick you. Me, desk jockey. So nothing glamorous in my army career. Uh, from accountant to army medicine to pen testing. Why didn't I become a dentist? I didn't want to become a dentist. The whole army dental story, that's a whole long other story that I didn't want to be a dental specialist. That just, it just happened. I did, I like the medical branch, so the medical branch is very relaxed. I don't think two masters look strange, no. Shows continuous learning. As long as they don't differ significantly, I guess. Uh, resources for learning Python? There's a ton. Depends how you want to learn. I mean, there's Code Academy. Uh, there's what I, if you're looking to learn like Python for pen testing, there's a bunch of books on that. Um, there's automate the boring stuff. There's a bunch of Python for beginner books. You could do coding challenges. There's a ton of places to start. Cybrary has uh, good courses. What programming languages we use often? I only ever use Bash and Python. I haven't gotten too deep. I'm not from a dev background by any means. So, and my coding is terrible. If you saw my script earlier, by any means, like, it's not perfect, but it does what I needed to do kind of work. That's sad. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate, appreciate your judgment. I would say I've done pretty well without having to know it. So you guys get me talking and we go past the deadline on the 1045. All right, we'll do hard stop 11 o'clock. That is, that is the deadline, mid-sentence. Devs definitely have a leg up, but 
doesn't mean that you're not going to find somebody who has no dev background that can hack better than a dev because it happens all the time. Yeah, you guys are 15 more minutes dadding me, definitely. PhDs are the scary ones. The only time I ever see PhDs, like, where I've worked, for computer science-wise at least, was when I was working at Sandia, but that was all research. That was a research lab, so. I haven't come across it, but I'm also not a director like you, sir. burn there's no burn you just get to see different stuff than i do where do competitive coders end up depends what you want to do do you want to do research if you're talking like insecurity you could work for the government you could work for a research boutique that tries to build tools you could work for the nsa um if you're talking security coding type deals, um, I feel like it starts to go into uh, research, tool development, etc. If you want to remain relevant with your coding background, if you're trying to do um, pen testing with the coding background, I don't wouldn't call it competitive. Hey M, how's it going, man? been going well what happened with hack the box uh so they canceled on me last second did not provide a reason other than um unfortunate event or something or unforeseen event was actually the was the quote unforeseen event so no apologies Took PTO time to actually work around their schedule when they wanted to do it. Um, they were very kind of cocky in the terms of how they came came at me. Uh, so I, it wasn't very professional. It was very unprofessional the way it all went down. Um, so not not very pleased with with how it went. Um, you, I can't fault hack the box themselves because this is. Uh, likely, who knows how old people running this type of AMA. It's not Hack the Box owners or whatever. Um, I don't know how old the mods are or any of that stuff. So, um, But it was a come back to us when you want to reschedule. Uh, no apologies, no understanding, nothing. So... How did I get into the AMA? They they asked they came to me and asked me to do the AMA. So it's unfortunate, but I, I don't think I'm gonna reschedule. Um just because of just because of the actions that went down if they would have been apologetic explained um and it's it's one person you know it, one person doesn't represent an entire organization but it definitely looks bad have you ever met ipsec i've talked to ipsec on several occasions i've never met him All right, I need this litter box. This is epic. Is it $500? Oh, I guessed it right. I guessed it right. $500. That's insane.
Do I own a useless box? I've never even heard of a useless box. I'll Google. Oh, one of those things? Uh, those are funny. What am I going to play with live? I do not own one. It would be fun to build one, I think. I'll keep it in mind. I've seen some good ones on Reddit trending on the front page. All right, one minute, ladies and gentlemen, one minute. And I need some sleep. Is that a Hoover behind me? No. It's some fake uh, Roomba because I'm too cheap to buy a real Roomba. Because they're like anywhere from 500 to to $1,000. All right, 11 o'clock. My people, it has been real. Thank you for watching. Uh, next week, we're going to start going into enumeration and uh, hopefully do some scanning and learning about all the cool little tricks we can do with Nmap and Metasploit and Nessus and all that other fun stuff. So thanks for hanging out, watching. I will see you guys next week.